Hi, I'm Wendell Steinhauer, president of the New Jersey Education Association. NJEA is committed to celebrating excellence in education. That's why we're proud to support Teacher Appreciation Week, a special series produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating New Jersey's talented and dedicated teachers. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by the New Jersey Education Association, Wells Fargo, Englewood Hospital and Medical Center, Montclair State University, New Jersey Sharing Network, dedicated to saving lives through organ and tissue donation, Verizon, and by the North Ward Center. Promotional support provided by New Jersey Monthly, the magazine of the Garden State, available at newsstands. And by New Jersey Family Magazine and njfamily.com. This is One on One. I'm an equal American just like you are. The jobs of tomorrow are not the jobs of yesterday. Look at this. You got this? Here it is, man. Look at it. Life without dance is boring. <laughs> when you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? Do you enjoy talking politics? No. People call me because they feel nobody's paying attention. Our culture, I don't think, has ever been tested the way it's being tested right now. That's a good question. High five. Hi, folks. Steve Adubato. Welcome to One on One. It is my pleasure to introduce one of the other, one of the many great educators in the uh, state and in the region. He is Jamie Valente. He's Director of Performing Arts at Teaneck Community Charter School. Good to see you, Jamie. Thanks for having me, Steve. Uh, you're a music teacher. I am. I 11 years. 11 years. You admit that. Yeah. Proud not, of it. <laughs> proud of it. Why exactly. music? Um, music just connected with me when I was in school. I was one of those kids, you know, I did well in the core subjects, but I spent the whole day waiting to get to choir and to get to band. So it was a logical progression. I wanted to move that passion onto another generation of students. And uh, this is a part of our series that we do in cooperation with, with our friends at the New Jersey Education Association. Uh, they do a great series called Classroom Close-Up um, uh, with our sister station, if you will, NJTV. And you're about to see a piece from Classroom Close-Up, the great series there. Um, this is called The Musical Brush, is that right? Yes. Let's take a look at this clip, uh, The Musical Brush. It's an initiative that you guys have, right? It's an initiative we started this year, uh, funded through an NJA Frederick L. Hip grant. We applied, and it's a brand new program based on a new concept, and they funded it. We just actually wrapped our final session of it for the year a couple weeks ago. Talks about bringing together the fine and performing arts. It does. Uh, Why don't we, we take a look at the clip, and then we'll talk. Sure. <laughs> it's called The Musical Brush, Classroom Close-Up. Let's check it out. All right, The Musical Brush is a concept Miss Abby and I came up with, figuring a way to relate emotion in art and music. Uh, the concept for the musical brush was to bring students and an adult from their family together into the school to have an educational experience that bridges the gap between art and music. You can clearly hear emotion in music. You can see emotion in art, but how does one translate to the other? They come up with their own answer throughout the night by working together and painting a canvas inspired by a style of music and an artist chosen by Miss Abby and myself. So we're gonna introduce you to a new artist tonight. His name is Corey Barksdale. Once I saw his artwork, I fell in love with it. It's amazing. It's these bright, vivid colors. Looking at his paintings, you feel jazz music. You know that, and he does. He listens to the music while he paints, which is exactly what we're doing tonight. Because jazz is such a mixture of different types of music. So how do we show that through art? Maybe the blues are influencing part of your canvas and something more rhythmic is in another. How do we make it work together? Try and like now just like splatter paint. You want me to splatter? When I paint, I feel like I can be very creative. I can just paint whatever's on my mind and all my stretches just go away. A lot of people will say when they hear music, they hear colors or they see colors. And I think this is a way to help them actually put it on the canvas. I like that. When I think of jazz, I see darker colors than um, usually other songs, because 
They kind of make it a little deeper sometimes. Our big goal was stop having visual arts and performing arts be separate. How do we finally put the two together and let a student and an adult learn? And that's where the project came from. I want them to maybe see their parents in a different light than they did see them. A different way to communicate with each other through colors, through lines. Something maybe that they can't normally express to their parents. There's no wrong answer when you come to the musical brush sessions. And that's what education should be. We're not teaching you facts and figures. We're teaching you how to think and be an individual. And that is what we're looking for to do with the parents. Bring them in, help them foster individuality and creativity in their children. I mean, how awesome. Parents, kids together, yeah. working on their art while listening to this great music. Yeah. Where'd the idea come from? Ms. Abby and I were talking. We had been through a staff meeting that was you know, centered around how do we bring the parents into the school in a positive light? We spend so much time nowadays talking about Common Core or the park. And you mean standardized tests? Standardized tests. Don't you love that? Oh. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> as a music teacher, it's essentially against everything we, we work to build. We work to build creativity. And you know, you can have your thoughts and I can have my thoughts and they're all valid as long as you can back them up with your knowledge. Standardized testing is the exact opposite of it. It's, you know, here's the right answer and there's this way to get to it. Use this way. It may have its place in certain subjects, but in the fine and performing arts, bringing them together, creating, is different. Absolutely. Because when you create something, you can't be wrong. When they're listening to this music and they're saying, you know, this is how it makes me feel, then how can you tell somebody that's wrong? Or it's, it's not good. Exactly. It, it's what they, and they worked on this with yeah. an adult from their family. Mm. So it could be, in some cases, they bring mom, dad. We had aunts and uncles, grandparents, older siblings, whoever you wanted to bring. And it fostered communication in a way that they don't get a lot of times. We had parents say, to us, this was the longest discussion I've had with my kids in You're a while. They this were, was a powerful interpersonal experience for them. Absolutely. They Did you were, anticipate that? That was actually a pleasant side effect. We were hoping that it would allow the students to communicate with their parents in a different way, explaining how they're being creative. But when a parent comes up to us and says, I found out an experience my kid had because they said, oh, yeah, this reminds me of a time yeah. when I, you know, and then you, they inserted the example there. Well, let me ask you, as an educator, mm -hmm. when we've spoken to so many terrific teachers, educators, through this series that we're doing on public television and, and our partners at Fios as well, with the NJEA, and, and there's, I'm blown away by the passion, the commitment, the excellence of these educators. For you, what does this do for you? This reminds me of why I decided to teach. It's helping students be who they are, show a creative side and give them an outlet that they might not receive otherwise. We are a public charter school. Make, make that clear to people. People say, oh, it's a charter school. You are a public. We are a public school. No student that attends our school pays any cent of tuition. There's no application or audition process in any way. They and their parents decide if they're a resident of Teaneck mm -hmm. and they'd like to go to the Teaneck Community Charter School, they enter our lottery for kindergarten. And if their number is chosen, they have a spot in the school. And we actually have a very extensive waiting list of students who are hoping to get into the school. What happens for some of these kids moving forward in terms of the potential outlets for them in these arts? Our, with us being in Bergen County and so close to New York City, the opportunities are endless for these students. We have students who have been accepted into arts high schools. Hmm. We've had students now go on to college to pursue uh, dramatic arts and fine arts from our school. And we actually have a great deal of parents in our community who are arts professionals themselves hmm. and come into the school to volunteer 
to build up the opportunities for our students. Jamie, before I let you out of here, um, I, my obsession, yours is music and teaching. Mine is leadership and the art of leadership and teaching about leadership. Greatest lesson you learned about leadership is? Everyone has value. Everyone has something that they contribute to a process, whether your title is the CEO or you are an intern. Everyone has something they can contribute, and you have to find that in them. I want to thank you. Um, we thank every educator who comes on this series for the work that they do for teaching our children every day and making a difference in their lives. Um, like it's the most honorable profession that we know of. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Jamie Valenti, Director of Performing Arts, Teaneck Community Charter School. Thanks so much. Stay with us. We'll be right back right after this. To see more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Hi, Steve Adubato. Uh, more importantly, it is my pleasure to introduce the president of the New Jersey Education Association, Wendell Steinhauer. We are, in fact, Wendell, at the uh, NJA convention here in beautiful Atlantic City Convention Center. Beautiful day, beautiful convention. Now we are shooting at the end of 2016, talking about uh, 2017. Uh, the world has changed in Washington. We'll see what happens uh, in the State House in New Jersey. Let me ask you this, before we talk about New Jersey, we have a new president. President-elect Trump, Trump, as we do this program, he will be taking office in Washington, talks about education policy. Put in the perspective of the role of the federal government, the role of the Department of Education in New Jersey education. Well, as you know, you know uh, we've looked at the federal Department of Education as the big intrusion into a lot of states. Uh, in New Jersey, for instance, we only get about 3% funding, not very much. But for all that they have to say and through no child left behind, race to the top, and now we're going into the ESSA implementation. Which what is, is actually, ESSA? You guys have a few acronyms? Oh, yeah. <laughs> ESSA is? ESSA is Every Student Succeeds Act, which was signed last December, almost a year ago, by President Obama, uh, to replace the NCLB, No Child Left Behind Act, that was in place for 13 years. And it, you know, it's, only, it's supposed to be reauthorized every five years, so we kind of went a while on that one. Um, the good thing about ESSA is that it's more state-driven and that uh, states can be putting their implementation plans in, and quite honestly, uh, that's what's going to be needed in March of 17 or June of 17. There's some thinking in the administration right now as to charter schools, guidelines. What are they? Why does it matter? And what do you believe uh, makes sense or doesn't make sense about them? Actually, in just in the last four or five months, uh, Governor Christie has really pushed on charter school reform, um, which it translates to loosening up the guidelines on uh, charter schools, and they just put uh, regulations through the Department of Education right now. They're still reviewing them right now. Um, but here's the thing with charter schools. It's been a 20-year experiment. 20 years charter schools have been in New Jersey. And they were originally to create this innovation and, and bring out good ideas and so on. So where we are on that is, it's time to take a pause. We're asking, let's get a study done on what charter schools have done over the 20 years. Is it fulfilling the original need? Where is it going now? And should we continue or make revisions on that? Who would do that study? What objective arbiter, uh -huh. judge, would look at this and come to those conclusions? What we believe is this would have to go through the legislature. Uh, so currently, with the current governor right now, Governor Christie, I would say nothing's going to get signed in that way. He's looking to do more of it through um, control of the Department of Education. As you know, he has a, a, the appointee of the commissioner there. So we're looking to um, possibly have a change in administration uh, and uh, move towards that. So it would be worked out in legislature. We will be proposing language for that and actually have tried to uh, get it through, but it hasn't come out of committee in the Senate. You know, 2017, a uh, big year in New Jersey. It's one thing to elect a new president, huge for the country. It's another thing in New Jersey, the 
uh, year that follows a presidential election is big. New Jersey and Virginia are one of the only two states in the nation electing a governor immediately thereafter. So in June of 2017, a primary, which in New Jersey and the Democratic side may not matter very much, the NJA has already come out and endorsed Phil we Murphy. Why so early? And what, in terms of education policy, draws you to Phil Murphy? Yeah. So we came out early. It's actually um, historic for NJEA. We have never endorsed uh, a uh, gubernatorial candidate in the primary. And we, uh, to be clear, we endorsed in the Democratic uh, uh, primary. And we'll be looking to see, once more people have come out for the Republican side, we'll be screening for that primary, too. But why did we get involved so early? We've, we've watched seven years of uh, mayhem through education, and we know that it's time for new leadership. And we look closely at all of the candidates and uh, our PAC. We have a process, our PAC organization. Your political action committee. Right. Uh, 125, sorry on the acronym. That's all right. 125 members of our organization made that decision to go forward uh, with an early endorsement and to screen them out. And on October 8th, we did endorse Phil Murphy. Um, Phil uh, certainly aligned with uh, many of our issues. Uh, I think he's a fresh of breath there, and I think he's what New Jersey as a whole, not only for education, but for everything, needs. Let's, let's take this one issue, which is critical. Talk the pension crisis in the state. Mm -hmm. What do you really believe Phil Murphy would do in terms of dealing with the massive debt, the, 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 the money that is owed uh, in terms of public employee pensions, what has he said to you and your colleagues that causes you to say, Phil Murphy's got a plan to get this done? What Phil has said is, well, first of all, he was on a pension commission back in 2005, a blue ribbon commission, which many of the things that they set out right now were, uh, it, it's a very simple thing to fix, actually. The problem is you have to be putting money in on a regular basis to make you sure that You mean the state of New Jersey out. does. And right. for those who say, quote, the money's not there to do it, it may sound simple in theory, but the money's not there from the state to do it without raising and it, taxes. And it's been 20 years since they put it in. And um, how they're going to get that revenue, uh, that's up to the legislature. That's fine. But right now, I know that if they don't start putting money in, actually, we just went down to the last we're, we're ranked 50th out of 50 states for our pension, state pensions. We were ahead of Kentucky and Illinois, and we've dropped below them. To get this pension system back in line, there has to be a steady stream of income. We're not saying this, look, this is a 20-year problem to start. It's not going to be fixed overnight, and we know that. And the plan to ramp up was, was, was smart and good to do. But here's the reality. In 2027, the state law says that it's a non-profitable right, those pensions will have to be paid. And right now, it's a $4.3 billion for what they should be putting in. It'll be $8 billion. And right. so I can ask the same question, where are they going to get it in 2027? And they're going to have to pay it, $8 billion of a current $34 billion. Real quick, before I let you go, yeah. Wendell, would you say in 2017, the pension situation and putting state money into the pension fund, number one issue in terms of your organization? It's in the top. Two or three, and yes. the other two are? Well, the top one would be the uh, Chapter 78, another uh, which, uh, which put a huge uh, burden on public school employees with the uh, amount they pay towards health benefits. And granted, that was done without collective bargaining. That was through state law in 2011. But it's put such a high, we've done studies now that we are now the highest contributing premium share of health benefits uh, in, across the state of Any New other? Jersey. Uh, pension and oh, all of the uh, I, I, I lump them into all the school issues. You know the uh, the SGOs, the Common Core, all of those things that need to, that I guess were thrown up on the wall uh, during the last seven years. And quite honestly, this governor is going to have to come in. Whoever is going to be the new governor, it's got a big mess to clean up, and it's uh, it'll need a lot of cooperation from everybody. And we look forward to being a partner in that. We are with uh, Wendell Steinhauer, who is, in fact, the president of New Jersey Education Association. We're at the Atlantic City Convention Center. This is the, uh, how many years have you guys been doing this? A few years? 163 years we've been an organization. And uh, a whole range of important education issues in 2017 and beyond that uh, faces not just the NJA, but all those who are concerned about public education and, and public school educators, if you will. 
Wendy, we thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank Thanks you. Thanks so much, Steve. Always a pleasure. You got it. <laughs> to see more one on one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We're here in Atlantic City at uh, Convention Hall at the 163rd uh, Annual New Jersey Education Association Convention uh, with the folks at Classroom Close-Up. Wanda, let me ask you something. You just told me, and I, it's got to be, uh, it can't be true. How many years have you been doing this? 23 years. 23 wonderful years. By the way, we've been um, uh, partnering with the NJA and featuring Classroom Close-Up, not just the video production from in the field, but the educators who, in fact, are profiled in the series for many, many years now. For those who don't know the series that is shown on NJTV, the public television station in the state, what is it? Our focus is the great things that are happening in the New Jersey public schools. So we do everything from math and science and STEM and STEAM and music and you name it, we do stories. We, we feature uh, uh, support personnel and the things that they do and, and what they contribute to the school community and every everything you can think of we've done stories on over the 23 years. There are some amazing things happening in our New Jersey public schools. There have been times I've interviewed, I've interviewed educators and I don't watch the classroom close-up stories before I see them in the studio by design frankly Wanda, because I want to react to them and they are incredibly powerful and emotional and they're actually hard to pick up the interview after that. Do you have the same feeling sometimes when you when the story is told and you realize how emotional they really are? You know, it's funny, when we're there, uh, sometimes when we're doing interviews, they start crying, I start crying, and then after they see the story put together, the five minute story put together, they get emotional because, first of all, someone's paying attention to what they're doing and acknowledging that. Why does that matter so much to them? They are so passionate, not about themselves, but about their students and what they can accomplish with their students. They're so proud of their students. They're, our educators are the most unselfish, dedicated people you can imagine, and all they care about is doing right by their students. Let me put you on the spot. Um, at the risk of, I don't want to create any problems with anyone else, you know where I'm going here. Give me one classroom close-up story in the last few months that you say, wow, that's going to stick in my mind uh, down the road. Ooh, last, you know, that is tough. Uh, I'll, I'll, one we did last year, um, it was a teacher, you interviewed him. He, he taught his kids how to make comic books, and it was all based on I remember this. survival stories. And, and, and what do you do to survive? And those stories were gut-wrenching. We didn't share some of those stories because they were too personal. Um, one was a child whose, parent, whose father beat his mother, and he wrote, he wrote a comic book about it. These kids are getting survival skills, and it's creative ways to help kids not only learn, but how to cope with life and how to be better people. We've done a lot of stories. Right now, we all are thinking about bullying. Um, stories, uh, programs on bullying right now are gonna be even more important than ever with the atmosphere right now. We can't- In our country. In our country. We cannot tolerate bullying. We've gotta have tolerance and understanding and patience and love for one another, whether they're Muslim or black or white or Hispanic or, and we've got a lot or of- women. Or women, and we've got a lot of immigrants in this state. A lot of, we've done stories on immigrants. We've, you've, uh, it's just, New Jersey is the perfect place to see all of the diversity. And we have incredible programs in the schools to teach tolerance and diversity. Final question. What would you say you're most proud of after 23 years of doing this? Um, and, and by the way, check out those videos on the NJEA website. They're, they never get old. There's one is more powerful than the next. What are you most proud of of your work? 
I am, I, you know, the Emmys are nice and fine. I'm, I'm proud of the body of work and the stories that, with the thousands of stories that we've told, that will live on forever. I mean, we're, they're all digitized. People can go to them anytime, and you can see the powerful stories in our schools. Uh, we've got people from other countries, other states that watch our stories. People are inspired, uh, and they get ideas, and they call each other, and they say, "How did you do that?" And they and they they get grants from these stories because people are looking at these powerful stories and saying, "You you need money. You need support." share your ideas. It's just the body of work I'm so proud of. On behalf of all of us in the public television family, well done to you, Wanda, and to your team at Classroom Close-Up. Thank you so much. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by the New Jersey Education Association, Wells Fargo, Englewood Hospital and Medical Center, Montclair State University, New Jersey Sharing Network, Verizon, and by the North Ward Center. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. New Jersey is a leader in solar power, and PSE&G is doing its part. With 24 solar installations in New Jersey, projects that are giving landfills new purpose and turning former brownfields green, solar powers more than our homes and schools and businesses. It powers our economy by creating jobs right here in the Garden State. PSE&G, proud to support New Jersey.